Hello and welcome to lecture number 73. This is topic 4.20, Science, Medicine, and Technology in Black Communities. There's three learning objectives today, and the first one is describe African Americans' contributions to scientific or technological advancements. African American inventions and scientific discoveries have had a global impact and have had made significant contributions to the fields of agriculture, technology, medicine, science, and engineering. For example, Louis Latimer in the late 19th and early 20th centuries helped to develop toilet systems for railroad cars and also created a better carbon filament for light bulbs, which improved Thomas Edison's design. Latimer was also the only black member of the Edison Pioneers, a group dedicated to advancing electric light technology. A more recent example is Patricia Bath, a pioneering ophthalmologist and inventor. She became the first African-American woman to receive a medical patent for her invention of the laser phaco probe, which revolutionized cataract surgery. She was also a strong advocate for addressing health disparities and blindness in the United States and worldwide. Her work led to the founding of the American Institute for the Prevention of Blindness in 1976. The College Board's main example is George Washington Carver, who was active in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He was born enslaved and later became a botanist and professor. He joined Booker T. Washington at the Tuskegee Institute in 1896 and taught there for over 40 years. He created over 300 uses for peanuts and over 100 uses for sweet potatoes. These included dyes, plastics, and fuels. One common misconception is that he invented peanut butter, but that is not true. His innovations for peanuts included chili sauce, shampoo, shaving cream, glue, and laxatives. He's also known for developing methods of preventing soil depletion. This was particularly important in the South, where cotton was an exhaustive crop that the Southern economy had historically relied on. By promoting crop rotation, particularly with peanuts and sweet potatoes, Carver helped restore soil fertility and improved agricultural productivity. His work helped transform the agriculture economy of the South, especially for African-American farmers. Carver's contributions extended beyond agriculture. In 1921, he testified before Congress to advocate for the use of peanuts in various industries. To add to the list of his accomplishments, he also served as a counselor in agriculture to President Theodore Roosevelt, which led to his influence on in sustainable agriculture practices. Carver's work also was so respected that he even advised Mahatma Gandhi on agriculture techniques to help improve food production in India. Next, we'll talk about African-American women in U.S. aeronautics and space programs. The first example is Katherine Johnson, a brilliant mathematician who worked for NASA for over 30 years. She was what NASA used to call a computer, an actual human who performed complex calculations by hand to determine the trajectory of rockets. Her calculations were crucial for John Glenn's 1962 orbit around the Earth, as he specifically requested that she verify the numbers before his mission. She was also part of the computing team that helped the Apollo 11 mission successfully land on the moon and return safely in 1969. Before NASA, Johnson worked at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which later became NASA, where she broke racial and gender barriers in the workplace. In 2015, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama, recognizing her vital contributions to space exploration. In 2016, the film Hidden Figures highlighted the work of Johnson and other African-American mathematicians, including Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson, who were also instrumental in NASA's success. Dorothy Vaughn was the first black supervisor at NACA and later became an expert in Fortran programming, a skill crucial for NASA's early computing. Mary Jackson went on to become NASA's first black female engineer in 1958 after fighting segregation policies that limited her education. The second example is Mae Jemison, who in 1992 became the first African-American woman to travel in space. She was a physician, engineer, and NASA astronaut who conducted experiments on bone cell research and microgravity during her time aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor. Before becoming an astronaut, Jemison worked as a doctor and served in the Peace Corps in Sierra Leone and Liberia, providing medical care and public health education. She eventually left NASA to pursue teaching and advocacy, promoting science education and encouraging minority students, especially young girls, to pursue careers in STEM. She also founded the Jemison Group, a company that develops technology to improve healthcare in developing countries. In 1993, she even appeared in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, making her the first real astronaut to appear on the show, fulfilling a childhood dream inspired by actress Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura. The second learning objective is describe African Americans' contributions to American medical care, training, and medical advancements. African Americans have played a vital role in reshaping the U.S. healthcare system, particularly expanding access to medical care and advocating for desegregation in healthcare institutions. This advocacy dates back to the early community-based healthcare initiatives, such as mutual aid societies. 
The first of these was established in Philadelphia in 1787, called the Free African Society, founded by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones. This was one of the first black mutual aid organizations in the U.S. and played a critical role in aiding black Philadelphians' population during the 1793 yellow fever epidemic. At a time when many white doctors fled the city, black volunteers provided essential care despite facing discrimination even after the crisis ended. Another key organization was the Black Cross Nurses, formed in the 1910s, which educated black communities about hygiene and disease prevention. This group was inspired by the Red Cross, but was created to address the medical neglect faced by black Americans, particularly in segregated southern states. A more recent example, which we discussed in a previous lecture, is the People's Free Medical Clinics, established by the Black Panther Party in the late 1960s and 1970s. These clinics were created even after the 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed, which mandated the desegregation of hospitals, because de facto segregation and racial disparity still persisted in the medical system. Many hospitals continued to deny black patients access to quality care, particularly in rural and southern areas. The Black Panthers clinics primarily provided first aid and basic health care services, such as childhood vaccinations, screenings for high blood pressure, lead poisoning, tuberculosis, and diabetes, diseases that disproportionately affected black communities. In the 1970s, they also introduced sickle cell anemia screenings, raising awareness about the genetic blood disorder that primarily affects peoples of African descent. All of these efforts were necessary because of segregation and discrimination in hospitals before the 1964 Civil Rights Act. In the 1940s, a report by U.S. Public Health Service revealed that black Americans had access to only 15,000 of the 1.5 million hospital beds in the country. Additionally, black doctors and nurses were often denied privileges at white-run hospitals, forcing them to establish their own medical institutions. Some of this disparity was addressed by establishing non-segregated hospitals in the late 19th century. The very first black-run hospital was Provident Hospital, founded in Chicago in 1891 by Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. Another significant hospital was Homer G. Phillips Hospital, which operated from 1937 to 1979 in St. Louis and became one of the leading training institutions for black medical professionals. At its peak, it trained more black doctors and nurses than any other hospital in the United States. The black hospital movement of the mid-20th century sought to expand healthcare services for African Americans. In this movement, black physicians collaborated with local governments to secure funding and establish hospitals that served black communities. As previously mentioned, the 1964 Civil Rights Act mandated the desegregation of public spaces, including hospitals, but full integration took years to achieve, and many black hospitals continued to operate until broader healthcare reforms improved access. The other part of the equation in expanding medical care for African Americans was training black doctors. In the 19th century, very few predominantly white institutions accepted black students into their medical schools. Rush Medical College was the first to do so, admitting David Jones in 1847, who graduated in 1849. At other universities like Harvard and Dartmouth, black students were occasionally admitted, but many were forced to leave due to protests from white students or were discouraged from pursuing medical careers. For example, in 1850, Harvard briefly admitted three black students but expelled them after white students protested. To increase the number of black doctors, African Americans established their own medical schools. The first was Howard University College of Medicine, founded in 1868, which provided clinical training at Freedman's Hospital, which itself was established in 1862 to serve the newly freed African Americans. Freedman's Hospital became one of the first federally funded hospitals in the U.S. and later merged with Howard University. Meharry Medical College in Tennessee was established in 1876 with the goal of being the first medical school in the South dedicated to training African-American physicians. By the early 20th century, Meharry had become one of the leading institutions producing black doctors, particularly those serving Southern communities where access to medical care was scarce. Historically, black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, have played an essential role in training black doctors. To this day, HBCUs have trained roughly 50% of all black doctors practicing in the United States. In addition to Howard and Meharry, institutions like Morehouse School of Medicine, established in 1975, continue to be vital in increasing black representation in the medical field. The American Medical Association, or AMA, is a national network of doctors initially barring black physicians from joining. As a result, black doctors founded the National Medical Association, or NMA, in 1895 to support the training of black medical professionals. The NMA became a crucial advocate for equitable health care access and fought against segregation in hospitals and medical institutions. During the Civil Rights Movement, the NMA played a significant role in pushing for hospital desegregation, particularly through its support of the Hill-Burton Act, also known as the Hospital Survey and Construction Act, which aimed to improve health care infrastructure while challenging racial discrimination. 
African Americans have a long history of contributing to medical advancements, dating back to the colonial era and the early 1700s. One of the earliest recorded contributions was from Onesimus, an enslaved man living in Boston with his enslaver Cotton Mather. He introduced Mather to the African practice of variolation, a method of building immunity by exposing individuals to small amounts of smallpox. The technique differed from European methods. Africans traditionally administered it by blowing dried smallpox scabs into the nose, whereas Europeans and Americans used to puncture in the skin. This method of inoculation helped reduce the impact of the 1721 smallpox epidemic in Boston. This experience with variolation may have also played a significant role in the American Revolution. Historians point to George Washington's decision to inoculate the Continental Army against smallpox as a key factor in the eventual victory over the British. By 1777, Washington mandated that all new recruits undergo inoculation, which drastically reduced deaths from smallpox within the army and ensured a stronger, healthier fighting force. Another significant figure in medicine was Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who founded the first black-run hospital, Provident Hospital in Chicago in 1891. At a time when most hospitals barred doctors from practicing, Provident Hospital provided critical training opportunities for African-American medical professionals. In 1893, Dr. Williams performed one of the first successful open-heart surgeries without the use of x-rays, antibiotics, or modern surgical tools, making his achievement even more remarkable. In the early 20th century, Dr. Charles Richards Drew, who studied at McGill University in Canada and later earned his doctorate in medicine from Columbia University, developed methods for blood storage and blood banking. His techniques made large-scale blood transfusions possible, which proved crucial during World War II. When the U.S. began organizing blood drives for Britain as they fought Nazi Germany, Drew's innovations in separating plasma from the whole blood allowed for longer storage and more efficient transportation. Despite his expertise, Drew resigned from the American Red Cross after it implemented a policy of segregating blood donations by race, which he openly criticized as unscientific and discriminatory. Another major medical contribution came from Henrietta Lacks, who in 1951 sought treatment for cervical cancer at Johns Hopkins Hospital, one of the few institutions at the time that treated black patients. Without her knowledge or consent, doctors took a sample of her cancer cells during treatment. These cells, known as the HeLa cells, became the first immortal human cell line, meaning that they could reproduce indefinitely in a lab. HeLa cells have been essential to medical research, contributing to breakthroughs in the polio vaccine, cancer treatments, AIDS research, and even COVID-19 vaccine advancements. Despite the enormous scientific and commercial success of HeLa cells, Henrietta Lacks' family was never informed or compensated, even as pharmaceutical companies profited from her cells. Finally, in modern medicine, Dr. Kismekia Corbett, a medical researcher, was a key scientist on the National Institute of Health, or NIH, team that developed the Moderna COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Dr. Anthony Fauci credited her as central to the team's efforts in designing a vaccine that successfully replicated the virus's spike protein, allowing the immune system to recognize and fight COVID-19. Her work contributed to one of the fastest vaccine responses in history, likely saving millions of lives and helping to end the pandemic-related lockdowns. The last learning objective is describe multiple compounding forms of discrimination against Black people with disabilities, as well as government's responses. In the 20th century, African Americans with disabilities faced compounded forms of discrimination, experiencing systemic oppression, medical abuse, institutionalization, and violation of their rights. One of the key reasons for this was the rise of eugenics, a pseudoscientific theory that promoted racial classification and the forced sterilization of people deemed inferior based on race and disability. Eugenics gained popularity in the United States in the early 20th century and was heavily promoted by American eugenicist Madison Grant, whose 1916 book, The Passing of the Great Race, argued for racial purity. Grant's ideas influenced eugenics policies worldwide and were even praised by Adolf Hitler and described it in a letter to Grant as his Bible. African Americans with disabilities were disproportionately targeted by these eugenics policies. One of the most egregious examples was the North Carolina Eugenics Program, which operated from 1929 to 1974. This program forcibly sterilized over 7,600 people, disproportionately targeting black women. Many individuals, including men, were classified as mentally ill or feeble-minded without proper medical evaluations, often based on racial class biases. One particularly tragic case was that of 14-year-old Elaine Riddick, who was sterilized after being raped. She was deemed unfit to be a mother by state authorities and was never informed of the procedure until years later. Another example of medical abuse was the Central Lunatic Asylum for Colored Insane, established in Virginia in 1869. It soon became a facility where African Americans were institutionalized without evidence of mental illness and subjected to horrific treatment. 
Due to segregation and a lack of medical training opportunities for black professionals in the South, all of the doctors at the asylum were white, while all the patients were black. Medical historians have described this practice as a form of medical colonialism, where black bodies were controlled, studied, and subjected to unethical treatment under the guise of medical care. Perhaps the most infamous example of medical abuse against African Americans was the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment, which ran from 1932 to 1972. The U.S. Public Health Service enrolled 600 black men, 399 with syphilis, and 201 without, under the false pretense of providing free health care. Instead, doctors studied the long-term effects of syphilis by deliberately withholding treatment, even after penicillin became the standard cure in 1947. The men in the control group were never informed of their diagnosis, and many died from the disease or passed it to their families. The unethical study was only exposed after whistleblower Peter Buxton, a public health worker, leaked information to the press in 1972. The revelation led to public outrage, congressional hearings, and the eventual establishment of federal protections for research participants, including the National Research Act of 1974. Our last slide focuses on the American Disabilities Act, or ADA, which was passed in 1990. This landmark legislation built on the civil rights achievements of the 1960s and the advocacy efforts of disability rights activists in the 1970s and 1980s. The ADA was heavily influenced by early legislation, including the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which first prohibited disability-based discrimination in federally funded programs. One significant African-American disability rights advocate was Brad Lomax, a Black Panther Party member who developed multiple sclerosis. Despite his condition, he became a key organizer of the 504 sit-in, which took place on April 5, 1977. The sit-in was the longest nonviolent occupation of a federal building in U.S. history lasting 26 days and successfully pressured the government to enforce Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which prohibited disability-based discrimination in federally funded programs. Lomax's activism connected the disability rights movement with the broader struggle for racial and social justice. The ADA prohibited discrimination against individuals with disabilities in multiple areas of public life. In Title I, employment is covered and it prevents employers from discriminating against qualified individuals with disabilities and requires reasonable workplace accommodations. Title II is public services and government programs. This requires equal access to public institutions, schools, and government services, ensuring that disabled individuals receive the same opportunities as others. Title III is public accommodations. It mandates accessibility in businesses, transportation, and public spaces. This includes ramps, elevators, braille signage, and accessing seating in public venues. Notably, this section also played a crucial role in improving transportation accessibility, leading to the widespread adoption of wheelchair lifts on buses and improved subway station access. Title IV is telecommunications, and it ensures telephone and communication access for individuals with hearing or speech disabilities through relay services and captioning. Despite the progress made by ADA, many public institutions still fail to fully comply with accessibility standards, particularly in underfunded Black communities. Studies show that Black and low-income neighborhoods are more likely to have inaccessible infrastructure such as missing curb cuts, poorly maintained ramps, and limited access to specialized transportation services. Additionally, Black Americans with disabilities often face unique barriers in healthcare access, employment, and education due to the intersection of racial and disability-based discrimination. And finally, here's the recap. George Washington Carver revolutionized Southern agriculture by developing new uses for peanuts and sweet potatoes. Katherine Johnson and Mae Jemison exemplify the contributions of Black women have made in space and aeronautics fields. African Americans have helped expand healthcare while also working to expand the number of black doctors. Contributions to medicine by African Americans date back to the colonial America. And African Americans have faced medical abuse and discrimination, though they have gained protections through legislation like ADA. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, click the thumbnail on the screen. And if you would like more resources to help you study, you can visit apushlights.com slash afm. I wish you the best of luck with your studies, and I hope to see you back on the next lecture.